This is episode number 802, our In Case You Missed It in June episode. Welcome back to the Super Data Science Podcast. I'm your host, John Crone. This is an In Case You Missed It episode that highlights the best parts of conversations we had on the show in the last month. This first clip you'll hear is from my interview with Dr. Jason Yasinski, one of my all-time favorite AI researchers. We had a great conversation about making your AI and ML models attractive to customers. In this clip, I got him to speak from his experience as CEO of the climate technology startup he founded, Winscape AI. This is a great case study if you're planning to launch your own AI models commercially. I'm sure that kind of engineering mindset is applicable to a lot of our listeners and it seems like your approach is working. So EDP, a large Portuguese utility company, recently selected Winscape as one of nine startups for its renewable innovation program in Singapore to accelerate the global energy transition. What opportunities do you see emerging from Winscape AI's participation in this program? Yeah. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, we, we we did apply for this program. We were, we were selected um, EDP is a huge utility. I believe they're the fourth largest wind owner in the world. So they own tons and tons of turbines. They generate a lot of wind energy. Um, when I met with folks from EDP, I found them to be a very, very forward looking organization. Sometimes you get a big company and they're like impossibly slow or something, but these folks are really like pushing the boundaries, all the boundaries they can, which I thought was super cool. Um, what we hope to get out of it and what, where, where that collaboration might go is to kind of pilot our technology, start working with them, see how it works on their wind farms around the world. And then if it does work really well, hopefully we roll out more broadly and we can also maybe use that as a demo for you know new potential customers. Very cool. Uh, so it sounds like EDP is forward looking, but in general, do you counter resistance or hurdles as you try to come to energy utilities and say, hey, you could be using AI like Windscapes to be improving the efficiency of your systems. Do you encounter uh, resistance or hurdles or is it relatively straightforward to convince people that you're doing something valuable? I wouldn't say it's straightforward. No, convincing people that what you're doing is valuable is maybe always hard. Um, (laughs) I would say saying the words AI or machine learning um, doesn't immediately open all the doors. It can open some doors. Some of these companies realize that they AI might be revolutionizing things that happen internally and they're not quite sure how yet, but maybe we should talk to these randos from Winscape and, and, and see what they think. Um, it does open some doors, but not all. Um, just as probably within any, any industry, there are some organizations that are kind of very forward looking and others early adopters right, of any technology and others that are slower, that are later adopters. They literally, some, some have told us, like, we don't care what you're slapping. Just show us when like four other companies are using it and then we'll consider using it because that's how we work, right? Which is a potentially an efficient choice from their perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's also small energy companies and large energy companies. And there's a, there's a spectrum there of like how you sell to these companies and how you um, get adoption and so on. So yeah, and it's convincing everyone, it, it can be hard. Um, you have to convince people that your technology will work, that it won't be a huge headache to adopt. Um, the people in the field need to buy into it. It can't, it can't like ruin their workflow or something. It has to be, it has to be possible to actually integrate. So some of these systems run software that's hard to work with and simply integrating can be difficult at times. So there's, I don't know, there's a lot of factors probably as, as in any industry. Yeah, it makes so much sense. And hopefully I'm not going too deep here. And if I am asking a question that would give away some kind of IP or just feel free to not answer this, but it seems to me like in a situation like yours, where you are providing software to hardware companies, say the turbine manufacturers, um, you are not, at least in the immediate term, planning on building, say, your own turbines, your own wind farms, you're a software company you need to be partnering with turbine manufacturers, with wind farm operators. Is that, uh, you know, how does that work? Are people kind of, I I guess maybe your response is going to be similar where there's a range of responses where some turbine manufacturers are relatively early adopters. They see the potential. They say, wow, you know, Jason's done a lot of amazing research in the past. He seems like the kind of person we should be working with to accelerate our roadmap. Uh, And then other folks are just like, yeah, you know, we've got our own team or I don't know. How how does it, how does it look when you, when you, yeah. 
when we started this whole endeavor, what we imagined would happen is we would first build products that we would sell to people that own the turbines. Why do they want them? Because our product would help them make more money starting next month, right? We help them make more money. They like our product. We roll out. They tell their friends. We deploy to more and more farms, more and more companies. As we start to sort of increase our market penetration in the industry, then much later, turbine manufacturers would notice. And they would say, hey, everyone's using these Windscape people. Maybe we should talk to them and consider integrating their thing uh, off the factory floor rather than kind of as an aftermarket add-on. Um, that's kind of still the process we're following, although we've been surprised that some OEMs are kind of interested in chatting early. I think they just want to have have on their radar what's going on in the world. And if there's any promising technology, they want to kind of be there first. So I guess we're already having some of those conversations too. And now we move from offers that tech companies can refuse to regulations that startups have a duty to follow. In this clip with the systems engineering and AI regulation guru, Dr. Gina Guillaume-Joseph, She lays out the evolving regulatory field for AI, which can be difficult to navigate even if you've got the best of intentions. Specifically, Gina and I talk about the AI Bill of Rights, the NIST AI regulatory framework, and her work on the MITRE Atlas. Explain for us, you mentioned there, so there's the NIST AI risk management framework. So NIST is the National Institutes of Science and Technology. Uh, That may be familiar as an acronym, the NIST thing, is something that for those of us who have done any deep learning, the kind of hello world deep learning example involves this handwritten data set of digits. So it's 60,000 handwritten digits done by, if I remember correctly, US postal workers, as well as elementary school students. And so it's these just hand, each image is a different digit. So it's, you know, some of them are zero, some are one, some are two, some are threes, all the way up to nine. And this handwritten uh, data set was curated initially, I guess, in the 90s, maybe even the, in the 80s, by NIST. And uh, then Jan LeCun, who's one of the most famous AI researchers of all time, he modified with his research team at the time, I believe they were at AT&T Bell Labs, they modified that NIST handwritten digit data set to create the MNIST, modified NIST, handwritten data set. So that's... I don't know, it's a bit of an aside, but that MNIST data set is probably familiar to anyone who's done any kind of deep learning at all. And so, yeah, so that same organization, NIST, it has been around for a long time in the US, I don't know how many decades, but has been um, trying to set up frameworks for all different kinds of industries in science and technology, and has now created this AI risk management framework, which, again, I'll have a link to that in the show notes alongside the AI Bill of Rights. Um, a third um, framework, I guess, you can correct me if I'm not using the right word there, that you brought up in your talk that also seems really helpful here is something called the MITRE Atlas. So uh, I've been trying to, as you've been speaking, kind of dig up what MITRE stands for, M-I-T-R-E. It doesn't seem like it stands for anything. Uh, can you tell us a bit about MITRE and the MITRE Atlas and then maybe you can weave together these three different things, the AI Bill of Rights, the NIST AI Regulatory Framework, as well as MITRE Atlas, and tell us how we can integrate these three frameworks together in order to have a good sense of how to move forward with the AI systems that we build. So MITRE is a not-for-profit organization. I worked for them for 10 years, um, and they support the federal government across all the federal government um, agencies to help them solve some of their most pressing challenges. So MITRE operates federally funded research and development centers in support of the federal government to, um, you know, to solve problems for a safer world, essentially, is um, is what MITRE does. And while at MITRE, I um, supported multiple agencies, Department of Homeland Security, Social Security Administration, the Veterans Affairs, uh, Department of Defense, in some of the challenges that they were facing at the time, um, societal challenges to include, um, you know, the, the, when the economy was 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 doing some downward slides and banks were failing. Part of some some of the work that I was that I did was um, at the FDIC. That was with Booz Allen, but you know, MITRE was involved in in other aspects of that as well to really understand. Um, 
the failures and to figure out the mitigation strategies to uh, ensure that, uh, you know, society didn't feel those impacts as, as broadly and as strongly. Um, MITRE created the Atlas Threat Model Introduction, um, Threat Model. It's this comprehensive coverage of, you know, AI-specific adversary tactics and techniques that includes real-world observation and reporting. It talks about um, accessibility and usability of AI, alignment with existing cybersecurity frameworks in terms of an AI pers- from an AI perspective, and that community engagement contribution and the educational resources and training. So they wanted, they're developing a, detailed taxonomy of tactics, of techniques, of procedures specific to AI systems that cover the entire life cycle from data collection to model development and deployment and maintenance, um, where they establish those mechanisms for continuously gathering and updating uh, threat intelligence based on real world cybersecurity incidents involving AI so that uh, the knowledge base remains current and relevant. So that's kind of what MITRE is doing it with their MITRE uh, Atlas framework. And it the, it the framework integrates their existing MITRE attack for enterprise framework that sh- shows that uh, they bring in that consistency and an interoperability across cybersecurity efforts as it pertains to AI systems. And that's my Atlas threat model. Terrifically useful context there from Gina. In my next clip, Alex Andora and I discuss Bayesian statistics, namely why being able to crunch larger and larger data sets has helped us to use a powerful modeling technique that was originally devised centuries ago. In addition to the podcast, you also, I mentioned this at the outset, I said that your co-founder and principal data scientist of the popular Bayesian stats modeling platform, PyMC. So like many things in data science, it's uppercase P, lowercase Y for Python. Uh, What's the MC, PyMC, one word? M and the C are capitalized. Yeah, so uh, it's very confusing because it stands for Python and then MC is Monte Carlo. Um, so I understand, <laughs> but why Monte Carlo? Um, it's because it comes from Markov chain Monte Carlo. So actually it should be pi MCMC or pi MC squared, which is what I'm saying since the beginning, but anyways, um, <laughs> yeah, it's actually, it's actually pi MC squared. Um, so be, for Markov chain Monte Carlo and Markov chain Monte Carlo is one of the main ways the other algorithms now, um, new ones, but like the blockbuster algorithm to run uh, Bayesian models is to use MCMC. Yeah, so in the same way that stochastic gradient descent is like the de facto standard for finding your model weights in machine learning, Markov chain Monte Carlo is kind of the standard way of doing it with a Bayesian network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so now there are newer versions, uh, more efficient versions. That's that's basically the the name of the game, right? Making the the algorithm more and more efficient. Uh, but the, the first algorithm dates back, I think it was actually invented during the um, uh, Project Manhattan. So during the world, during World War II. Um, Game of the day. Yeah. And uh, lots of physicists actually, um, statistical physics is, um, is a field that's contributed a lot to, uh, to MCMC. Uh, and so, yeah, like phys- physicists um, who came to the field of statistics and trying to make the algorithms more efficient for their models. And uh, yeah, so they like they have contributed a lot, like the field of physics has contributed a lot of big names and people to to great leaps into the um, realm of more efficient algorithms. And so I don't know who your audience is and but that 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 may sound boring, you know, yeah, like the algorithm, it's like the workhorse, you know. Uh, but it's extremely powerful and that's also, one of the main reasons why Bayesian statistics are increasing in popularity lately, because I'm going to argue that it's always been the best framework to do statistics, that to do science, but it was hard to do with pen and paper, because the problem is that you have a huge nasty um, integral on the numerator, 
uh, on the denominator, sorry. And this integral is not computable by pen and paper. So for a long, long time, Bayesian statistics combined two features, you know, like uh, campaigns, uh, PR campaigns, Bayesian statistics was relegated to the margins because it was just super hard to do. Uh, and so for other problems other than very trivial ones, it was not very applicable. But now with the advent of personal computing, you have these incredible algorithms like, so now most of the time it's HMC, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. That's what we use under the hood uh, with PyMC. But if you use Stan, if you use NumPyro, it's, it's the same. Um, and thanks to these algorithms, now we can make extremely powerful models uh, because we can approximate the posterior distributions thanks to, um, well, computers, uh, computing powers, uh, computing power. Like a computer is, is is very good at computing. I think that's why it's called that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and so that reminds me of deep learning. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's a similar kind of thing where the, the applications we have today, like your chat GPT or whatever your favorite large language model is, these amazing video generation like Sora, all of this is happening thanks to deep learning, which is an approach we've had since the 50s, certainly not mm -hmm. as old as Bayesian statistics, but similarly, it has been able to take off with much larger data sets and much more compute. Yeah, 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 very good point. And I think that's even more the point in deep learning, yeah, for sure, because Bayesian stats doesn't need the, the scale, but the way we're doing deep learning for now def definitely the, need the scale. Yeah. yeah, yeah, scale of data. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Yeah, sorry. And, yeah, this case, because there are two scales, data and, and computing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, and for like model parameters. And yeah. so that has actually, I mean, tying back to something you said near the beginning of this episode, is that actually one of the advantages of Bayesian statistics is that you can do it with very few data. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe fewer data than with a frequentist approach or a machine learning approach. Yeah. Because you can bake in your prior assumptions and those prior assumptions give some kind of structure, some kind of framework for your data to make an impact through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, completely. And in keeping with the theme of returning to the past to find golden opportunities, I speak to Dr. Nathan Lambert about historical influences on contemporary methodologies. I also managed to sneak in a question about reinforcement learning from human feedback. Nathan is a research scientist for the Allen Institute for AI and previously built out the RLHF team at Hugging Face, so there was no better person to ask about the lack of robustness in RLHF and how that could impact the future development and deployment of AI systems. Another really cool thing you've done related to RLHF is you have traced uh, it back to ancient philosophy and modern <laughs> economics. So mentioning Aristotle and the Van Neumann, Morgan Stern, utility theorem, for example, I don't really know what the uh, VNM utility theorem is, but how do these historical foundations influence current methodologies? And what can modern AI research learn from these early theories? Yeah, so this is a fun paper with a few colleagues that I started working with at Berkeley and now we're kind of spread out. Um, this is all based on the fact that like RL is very deep multi-field, um, multi kind of multidisciplinary history, <laughs> where it's like, it, go, it goes way back. And then the notion of preference is a very vague thing in economics. and it's like the von Neumann Morgenstern theory is a foundational thing that essentially it's like you can express um, either all behaviors or all goals as probability and expected value distributions, which essentially lets you do like expected value math over preferences. And then it led to a bunch of debates on whether or not preferences like <laughs> actually exist and are tractable in any of these things, or if they're, they're actually if they're actually measurable or not due to the preference shift over time based on context. So these are the kind of things that we take and it's like it, ask a lot of a lot of questions on how this impacts the modern RLHF process. It's things like um, is the final model's preferences, which is really, we're mapping onto very human terms. Is that actually based more on the preference model, the the base model, which is scraped from the internet, than the like human preferences that they get from somewhere like Scale AI? So it's like if it's based more on the internet crawling than this million dollar data set they're getting from Scale AI, it's like kind of confusing to the marketing or we're saying we're learning a preference model, but it might not actually do that much. There's other things like OpenAI now has a ton of user data, and it's like what does the economics literature say about generating? 
data for training that comes from a user context or a professional context where someone is paid to do it and they're paid to act in a certain way. And how does all of this mix? So it's really just like a super long list of questions of like why play, why we should look at other social sciences if we're making grand claims about human preferences and all of these things. Nice. Well, fascinating. Tons to dig into there for our listeners. Um, final kind of topic that I planned related to RLHF, I'm sure it'll come up again, <laughs> kind of organically in the conversation. But um, you've mentioned that RLHF is not even robust to fine tuning. And so removing the safety layer from models like GPT-4 and LLAMA-2 can break down the notion of safety. Um, can you elaborate on the implications of this fragility for the future development and deployment of AI systems? Yeah, so this is like very this is like a specific line of research. There's a few papers that showed that if you like keep if you take a model like Zephyr or Tulu that we were mentioning, if they have like safety in the data set, if you then go and fine tune it again on some different task, you'll lose some of the behaviors that are quote unquote ingrained in the model. I honestly think this is a little bit more like clickbaity than like actually worrisome because it's really not surprising given the like if you just look at the amount of compute applied at fine tuning like we pre-train these models for trillions of tokens and then we apply like a couple billion tokens of compute at fine tuning and it's like we're not changing the weights of the model substantially like we're we're doing a slight nudge and it makes sense that a slight nudge could be undone at the same way but if you to take or to take this to some of the bigger labs, what you hear is that like safety is not just like a, a single artifact thing. Like safety is much more about a complete system than a model. So like open weight models being sa unsafe or unsafe, I don't consider it to be that big of a deal. It's like if you were to apply them to a free endpoint that everyone on the internet could talk to, then I don't want my model saying good things about Hitler and like all these obvious things. But if it's like a research artifact that you like need to spin up GPUs to use yourself and it's like a little bit more I'm more open to having these diversity of models exist. And but if you ask Anthropic or somebody, it's like, what happens if like how do you get safety into your model? And it's like it's not just RLHF. Like you need to have safety at the pre-training, any preference model you train. And then all of these models have a safety filter on the output. So like to chat to BT, it reads all the text generated from the base model. And then there's like a go no-go where it, it will rephrase the text if it gets a no-go signal, which is like their content moderation API. So it's like it's kind of a double like it's like I it's the type of thing where it's researchers need to market their work, but it's not as big of a deal as I think it is. It's like, okay, I think it has interesting business downstream things with liability. So it's just like if you want to fine tune a, meta, a llama model, you normally do that on your own hardware. But OpenAI has a fine tuning API. And if they like claim their model is safe, but any fine tuning on their API that they then host makes it unsafe. Like that seems like more of a business problem, which is like, oh, it's a nice way that open ecosystem might be better off because it kind of breaks the liability chain. But I, I, we'll see this research continue to evolve. It's like it's so early at all of these things. We're like a year in. <laughs> all right, that's it for today's In Case You Missed It episode. Be sure not to miss any of our exciting upcoming episodes. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast if you haven't already. But most importantly, I hope you'll just keep on listening. Until next time. Keep on rocking it out there, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.